Hi, Dean. Hello. <laughs> there you go. Hello. Uh, I'm Sasha uh, hosting this, uh, this meetup tonight. Thank you very, very, very much for uh, accepting to, to spend time with us and, and answer uh, our questions. Uh, we have a, a bunch of people here who are absolutely uh, passionate and, and very, very interested in, uh, in creativity. So uh, thank you very much for, for, um, for joining us tonight. Uh, oh, sure. And thank you for showing that so I didn't have to give a talk. <laughs> yes, that, that's the way we found a, we found an agreement. Uh, just in the UK, it's very cold. Uh, how? Just you know, completely uh, irrelevant question. What temperatures do you have in California right now? Right now, it's about fifty-one. Wow. So <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, we're, having a, we're having a cold spell. <laughs> <laughs> I was in my t-shirt a few a few days ago doing uh, yard work. That's that's the time where we were wearing our our thick jackets and and uh, yeah. and thick hats. Um, so yes, um, I think um, uh, many people enjoyed uh, the talk uh, tonight. Uh, so um, the the goal of all of this is to uh, be interactive. So um, who would like to start asking questions? I have plenty of questions. <laughs> Terry is wearing his Batman mask tonight. That's very creative. But anyway, <laughs> um, do we have a um, someone who would like to, to start with the questions um, for Dean tonight. Um, I'll go first. Um, Hi, Nick. Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. It was really interesting. And I just had, I made a note, and I don't know if this is really a question, but you said something about generate and test, and you didn't know where that came from. Um, when you had like a list of... Um, yeah, like generate and test. Area. I was trying to find where that the original statement of that was. I know it was in probably artificial intelligence research, but do you know? I, I wondered um, if there's like um, the Miller, Glanter and Pribram model, like the tote model test, operate, test, exit from 1960. And I wondered if it was from that. Yeah, I, but it might have been before that. I really don't know. Because I, I haven't been able to find an actual citation for it. Okay. Um, I think it's one of those things that has been around for so long. Like, like trial and error, a lot of people don't even know where that, that goes all the way back to Alexander Bain in 1855. Um, and a lot of people don't yeah. even know that because it's been around for so long. So, um, you know, I, I really don't know, but if, if, in, if you can find a citation for it, I'd be glad to see it, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah. I just thought it, it related to like, you know, that paper, but if it, you think it goes back before then, then yeah, I don't know. Right. Um, I, I wondered if if I could ask a bit about so the model, you know, is um, is that kind of like a psychological model or is it kind of you know because you said like we work in a domain and people are kind of maybe embedded within systems. So I wondered if you could just kind of say because the video was a lot to take in, like how um, the kind of originality gets noticed. You know, could somebody create something? Um, but it might not be recognized because you know they're not working with other experts or you know people to recognize the novelty or the originality of that kind of creative invention or, or product. Yeah, my specific focus on uh, in that talk was what's going on inside the head. Even though I got my PhD in social psychology, uh, my presentation was completely non-social, and uh, and that's because it raises a whole bunch of other complexities. So my focus is on personal creativity, which is the scientist's own judgment of the uh, originality, utility, and surprise associated with a particular combination. Um, the second you start looking at the judgments of others, then you open up a big hornet's nest. Because one of the problems is, um, Fields differ substantially. I, I've done a lot of research on uh, what's, been, what's called the uh, Kantian hierarchy of the sciences. You know, we talk about the hard sciences and the soft sciences. 
one of the fundamental differences between the hard sciences and the soft sciences is how much consensus there is on what constitutes a contribution to the field. In uh, the hard sciences, there's a really strong agreement. This is good stuff. Uh, Einstein was very quickly recognized for his, his work, uh, particularly on, uh, starting off with the photoelectric effect, but even his special theory of relativity he was very quickly recognized. Uh, Marie Curie was very quickly recognized. She got, she got the, um, the Nobel in the same year that she finished her doctoral dissertation. You know, so in, in the hard sciences, um, there's a really good consensus. I mean, there's exceptions, of course, but for the most part, there's a very good consensus on what's got, and there's, and this has been documented. This is not anecdotal. You know, they have measures, for example, of, of citation immediacy. How soon after someone published something, do they start accumulating lots of citations? And if, if it's a really major contribution, the accumulation is very, very fast. Uh, and the same thing for how quickly to get a major awards, the a, a Nobel Prize. But um, there's other areas, like unfortunately psychology, <laughs> where the consensus is very low. And as a consequence, um, there'll be ma major disagreements. In fact, one of the things that's kind of interesting is when you submit papers for publication in psychology, you'll often notice that the reviewers don't even, they don't, not only do they not agree with you, they don't even agree with each other on you know, the merits of what you just submitted. <laughs> it's, 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 it's terrible. So the point is, is I, that's why I leave out the, uh, the social side of it, the domain side of it. And of course it gets even worse when you go into the humanities and the arts where there's just absolutely no consensus whatsoever on the merits of, of, um, you know, the, of a creative product. So I hope that answers your question. Can I, can I just ask a follow-up then? Because if you said it's yeah, all sure. in the head, you know, and this might be a naive question because I'm still absorbing it, but could we, we identify this on a brain scan? You know, to maybe like what's going on. You know, does your brain light up, or is a certain kind of pattern? Well, the, the, the problem with um, you know, there's there actually is a lot of work in the uh, neuroscience of creativity, cognitive neuroscience of, of creativity, and one of the problems with research, and I sort of talk about this in my in my talk. I don't specifically talk about the neurosciences, but I mentioned that there's a lot of different processes and procedures that are involved in generating combinations. And they all take place in different parts of the brain, operating with different modalities. You know, some may be using visual thinking, some may, may be using verbal thinking. And, um, and so it's really hard to be able to identify a part of the brain that's doing this. Um, and so even though it's all in the head, it is, it's, it's not in a particular place in the head. And in fact, one of the things that's very interesting is um, one of the um, neuroscience correlates of creativity uh, turns out to be um, something called the, the, the default network. Some of you may have heard of the default network. And this is what, what happens to the brain when it stops processing information. And a lot of different parts of the brain will get kind of semi-active and just kind of, well, you just, you just, you're just freely thinking kind of random thoughts going from one thing to another, uh, no focus attention. You're not looking at anything in the external world. You're not thinking about anything in particular. And then in this state of mind wandering, you're more, that's mind wandering that's a cognitive counterpart to the default mode network. Um, in this state, you're more likely to come up with a major insight, a new combination. You know, it's, I mean, the classic example is Archimedes takes a bath, starts relaxing, and then notices that the water overflows in the tub, and that solves his, his gold crown problem. And unfortunately, it's, uh, it, it created a new problem for the goldsmith because he had his head chopped off. But anyway, um, so in that case, there's no part of the brain that's active. You know, it's kind of a very diffuse um, activity uh, when the brain is not doing anything. Thanks. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Nick, for the questions. Um, we have uh, Rachel uh, has a question, and then I know Terry has uh, questions as well. If you guys want to uh, let me know uh, if you have questions, like use the chat or, or raise your hand. Uh, Rachel, carry on. But you actually, I think you answered me. Um, I was going to ask if, it, if the surprise was like the terrain of the, uh, this thing being received, the creative intention, the reception of it, and you answered that. But um, I did, I was just going to ask you actually about the, um, the default network. That kind of makes sense when you think about it being really diffuse energy, because that's the bed, the bath, and the, um, what was the other one? The cleaning table. Oh, you're talking about Margaret Bo Bowden, yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh... yeah, it just made perfect sense. It's like when you're cleaning and, you know, you're, it's the diffuse, like you're not focusing, you're not using any sort of cognitive bandwidth there. It's all just, yeah. And, and that's the, the interesting thing. Um, because, you know, I, I develop a typology, which I talk about, and um, one of the types of sort of combinations of the, of the three parameters is where you have a very low probability and uh, a very low utility and a very low prior knowledge of utility. But the thing that's interesting is in the default mode network or in mind wandering, you the utility doesn't have to be low. Utility can be high because the thing is, is that you don't know what the utility is. So you can't use your knowledge of the utility to make a decision about whether you're gonna pay attention to it or not. So that's why every once in a while, your mind is just wandering. God, you, I wish you hadn't asked that question. It's the bed, the bath, and the bus. It was the bus. That comes from Poincaré. As soon as he got on a bus, all of a sudden he got this major insight. And it's the same kind of thing where you're not, you're just not paying attention to anything in particular. Your mind is just wandering. But the point is, is that in that state, because it allows low probability concepts into the into the into your mind, and it allows concepts in that you are so improbable that you don't even have any awareness of whether or not they'd be useful or not. And of course, most of them aren't. Most of our daydreams are usually useless. Okay, but every once in a while, it allows in an extremely useful idea. And then you have the aha experience. Kind of weird doing this because you guys are moving around, you know, Rachel was over here and then she's like, I don't know why that works that way, but anyway. There's a lot of chaff in the, yeah, there's a lot of chaff in the daydreams. There's a, but there's the bit of wheat every, every so once in maybe 10 years or something. Yeah. So we have uh, questions from uh, Terry, then Marina, then Alex, and then Daniel. <laughs> Everybody's very keen, which is really good. I really like that. Uh, so Terry. Um, we've heard a lot about theories. I'm interested in whether you think theorists themselves should be concerned about the applications of their theories by other people. Oh, that's an interesting question, because I I don't know if you got to that question, but one person in the audience asked me at that Stanford talk, asked the question, what, what, what is the utility of your theory kind of thing? And of course, I gave a typical uh, theoretician answer. I said, uh, combinatorial models make a lot of very precise predictions as well as having a lot of explanatory power. So I've worked out various implications of these uh, models. I think the example I mentioned at the Stanford talk was um, uh, the phenomenon of multiple discovery, where you have two or more people come up with the same idea, uh, often simultaneously. And I've developed combinatorial models of that that predict the precise features of those multiple discoveries, like how many people can be credited with a particular discovery. It turns out it has a very distinctive Hassan distribution. Um, but she wasn't very satisfied with that. And, and neither was everybody else in that uh, conference because one of the things I didn't realize is even though I did the opening address, um, I represented what was considered old school meta-science. Uh, meta-science actually goes back to the 1980s. My first meta-science conference was in 1986. And, um, but back then, 
it was interested more in understanding the creative process in the sciences. So it was more theoretical and more empirical. It wasn't applied. Uh, the current version of meta science is more interested in application. How can we make science better? How, uh, in particular, uh, I'm sure a lot of you know about the replication crisis and the behavioral and social sciences. How, we, how can we make it so that we can replicate our findings? It's very frustrating to have all these classic findings that cannot be replicated. And so what are we doing then? You know, how can we consider ourselves a scientist for not accumulating knowledge? So I've always strongly believed that you can separate the two and it's wise to separate the two, that is application and theory, because a whole bunch of stuff is involved in application that, that makes it much more complicated than in theory. It's much more complicated to, um, create a nuclear bomb or a nuclear reactor than it is to um, figure out the underlying theory, theoretical physics of a nuclear chain reaction. And so um, that's why I tend to focus on the, on the theory. Um, but on the other hand, I do, you know, I do uh, study applications and um, you know, I'm a reviewer, I'm an editor, I get submissions to look at. And so um, I just, just reviewed one recently that pr provided a minimal theory of creativity that they hope would be more effective in predicting creativity. So I'm not totally opposed to it, but I also don't think I'm very good at it. I think you have to be in the trenches to have the kind of experience to be really good in application. So we have uh, Marina, uh, then Alex, then maybe back to Terry. Oh no, the Daniel and then Terry. Marina. Well, thank you very much. Um, um, it's really nice to have you here, Dean, uh, joining this group. Very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I am um, a lecturer in the Cambridge School of Art and the Cambridge School of Creative Industries here in the UK, Cambridge, and I also lecture at the Norwich University of the Arts. Um, I mainly teach postgraduate students and um, it's kind of hard to hear you. I think it's part of part is your accent and part of it is um, you're not close enough to the microphone. Oh, I'm really sorry. Um, can it's I, okay. Can you hear you're, you're me? You're better now. You're better okay. now. Um, so um, basically what um, is, is, is not a question with a question mark at the end. It's, it's just um, voicing my um, my thinking process and seeing whether you you can react to that um, whenever so so in in teaching arts we try to give students some sort of structure the incubation pro, uh, process and, and all of that but nothing really works because mainly mm, these things have been thought and theorized um, from outside of, of the, of the create, uh, creative practices, if you will. And then I also work with the um, Nordic Summer University and we're trying to develop in our own practices as artists, some, some sort of um, lexica and uh, some sort of um, methodologies that are um, exclusively for us, for the creative practices. And uh, it's, for me, the distinction between the theory and the applied theory is, is a little bit kind of, it comes imposed from the outside because for artists, we, we don't apply the theory. We, the way we do research is through our artistic practices. So we can, we can do somatic experiences, symbolic experiences, collective experiences, and all sorts of different uh, opening spaces for dialogical experiences, for instance. So not everything happens in the brain and not every um, sort of creative process has a clear pattern. Um, and so, so basically 
my idea is um, that when I hear your um, your talk, um, it could fit well um, a scientific sort of um, um, sort of study of creativity in the in the in the sciences, but not necessarily in the arts. What do you think about that? Is, well, is this um, just first of all, <laughs> yeah, I'm answering the question. First of all, the talk was specifically focused on scientific creativity, so. Um, that, that meant all my examples had to do with scientific creativity. I started off with a list of uh, various examples of um, combinations in the science, you know, like Newton's mechanics, that kind of thing. But I also have done research on combinatorial models in the arts as well, and, other, and others have as, uh, too. And so, um, so it's not something that is separate from the arts. And, and let me give you an example. I've done a couple studies taking advantage of the, uh, the sketches that Picasso did for Guernica. He, he left lots of really great sketches. Uh, most of the major figures in the painting, he has multiple sketches of, and they're clearly combinatorial in nature. They're very concretely combinatorial. You can see, for example, he uh, did an etching about was like five years earlier, uh, Minotaur Archie or something like that. I don't know if that's the exact pronunciation of it. And you can see images that they took from that. And then he would subject them to various permutations. So they would end up in Guernica in a very different way. Uh, for example, in the etching, there's a young woman who is off to the side and she's kind of walking up a ladder or something, and she's holding a lamp uh, over this kind of strange scene, which is actually not unlike the scene you have in, your, in the background. Uh, there's a, a, a woman that is laid out on the back of a um, monitor. Yeah. And um, in any case, what Picasso did is he took that and he did various kind of transformations and it ended up at the top of the painting and still had the same function. It's holding a lamp over a, a horrific scene, but in a different way. And it's not a young person anymore who looks kind of naive and innocent. It's now, it's like maybe a mother or something who hears all this racket because you know the, 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 the fascists are bombing Guernica. And, um, so you see the combinations operate there. So the combinatorial model still operates. And I've also done stuff in uh, music. Music is extremely combinatorial. You know, you take, you take melodies that are constructed from tones, uh, like a theme variation form in classical music, and you do various manipulations of those tones, various transformations of, of those tones. One of my favorite examples is um, a, a famous, uh, variation work of uh, Rachmaninoff based on uh, a caprice by Niccolo Paganini, the 24th uh, caprice. And he, su he subjects this theme, which is very, very famous. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna hum it for you because I'm not a Paganini when it comes to singing. But he does various transformations. And one of the transformations he does, one of the combinations he does, he says, what happens if I turn it upside down? And when he turned it upside down, it, it converted to one of the most beautiful themes in all of classical music. And his first response, when he, when he, when he did that, he says, this is for my agent. <laughs> because he knew it would be a hit. And that theme is often played separately from, from the piece and there's been words set to it. And, but to get back to your original question, the arts are combinatorial too, okay? They're always a combinatorial in different ways. But I also want to say one other thing that is, that's very important because not everything in a creative product, whether it's artistic or whether it's scientific, is, um, is creative. This is something a lot of people don't realize. Um, a lot of creativity involves domain-specific expertise, uh, knowing how to mix paints, how to, how to form lines, uh, how, to, how to construct accompaniment to a melody, things like that. Um, that is one of those types where I have uh, listed at the very beginning 
where the uh, probability is near unity, the utility is near unity, and your prior knowledge of the utility is near unity. You know exactly what you're doing. You know exactly what works. And even in, even in Guernica, there are parts of Guernica where he knew exactly right from the very beginning what an image was gonna look like. He put it there and it stayed in the painting when it went through transformation after transformation after transformation. He did not undergo combinatorial creativity at all in those parts of the painting. Um, so even artistic works will have major components of expertise. And that is just, you know, this idea that you can naively produce a masterpiece without knowing what you're doing in the arts is, is, is absurd. You have to know what you're doing. You have to have training. And, and of course, we know Picasso had tons of training. And uh, Rachmaninoff had tons of training. So, so I hope that addresses your, the, the issues. That you're Marina, what do, you, what do you think, Marina? Thank you very much. Very comprehensive uh, um, answer. And um, Guernica, yes, I grew up looking at Guernica and I was part, uh, I'm, I'm, I lived in Spain when uh, Guernica came back to Madrid right. uh, um, and when it was, so it was a process of coming back. So it's not just the painting, but the narrative around the, the painting. And um, it was behind bulletproof uh, glass and eventually when it transitioned to democracy, the, uh, the bulletproof uh, glass uh, came down and now is, uh, is there for everybody to enjoy. Um, I got to see Guernica just before it left for Spain, <laughs> when it was okay. still in New York. All I got right. to see Guernica yeah. just, just before it left for Spain, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yes, yes. Um, so we, um, that is, 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 is beyond a painting, is a political uh, icon and encapsulates so much more than just uh, Picasso's work. Um, but um, there are many also female painters that that paint that you can follow the process of things appearing in the canvas and then uh, being, you know, retouched and moved around and sketches that you can follow all that kind of thinking process, if you will. Uh, but, it, but even though when you see the sketchbooks, it is very difficult to trace the creativity process. It, it really is, 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 is just a little bit of signposting some sort of what, what goes behind the scenes, but um, not every artist has, uh, has that way of approaching. Some, right. some artists, they would go in one, one go, one take, that's it. Uh, so that's why, I, I mean, that, and some, 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 some of the creative process artists uh, that use collectives, and that's a very new movement, recent phenomena uh, since the, the 60s. So um, 60s, 70s, and now the you know, relational aesthetics and things that uh, you need more people and you need the, the, what comes, the product of the relationship between the people, that is the creative process. So th that is what is the art. So, so it gets really in interesting and complicated. So, but, um, Beautiful, um, beautiful exploration. And yes, I'm aware that you were uh, addressing scientific creativity, but yeah. uh, I come from the other the other side, so I needed to. Maybe, maybe, more, <laughs> maybe more people yeah, but... means more combination. Actually, uh, <laughs> who knows? Uh, I see lots of uh, uh, raised hands. Uh, um, thanks for your patience, everyone. Uh, we have uh, Alex, uh, Daniel, and Martin. I'm just, however, going to insert. <laughs> insert a question in that because uh, this concept of combination of ideas and reorganization how does that fit with the uh, intention of being creative and just to qualify uh, my question what i'm interested in is creativity in entrepreneurship where you have um you know uh, 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 investors who are uh, uh, giving you one million dollar to for you to be intentionally creative and do some disruptions and do some successful products so uh there is a bit of a, of a, on the one hand, theory says it has to be combinatorial. On the other hand, you have behavioral economics saying, I don't want to lose my million dollar that I give you for you. Right, to be right. So it's very important to be intentional in your creation. Uh, have you seen that? Well, in I mean, first, um, you know, the, the, 
The best research I've done that's relevant to that question uh, was of one of the greatest in inventors in history, um, Thomas Edison. In fact, until the uh, early 21st century, he held more patents than any other inventor in history. Um, but what's interesting is he definitely operated by accommodatorial, pro by accommodatorial processes and procedures. He once said, all you need to be an inventor is imagination in a pile of junk. <laughs> because he would just basically make things out of junk. I mean, it was it wasn't really junk. It was you know various kinds of electrical equipment, you know, capacitors and resistors and you know, things like that, uh, um, electromagnets. But um, the point is, is that he was definitely conatorial. And when he finally reached a point where um, he became pretty famous for his inventions, and he decided to become entrepreneurial and and get investors. So instead of inventing and then trying to sell a product. He would get investors in advance. And he even promised that, he, I forget the exact wording, but it was like, like a big invention uh, every six weeks and, and a small invention every week or something like that. You know? But the thing is, is that he could not deliver on his promises. There were a lot of inventions and some of these attracted a, a huge amount of investment um, that totally failed. Uh, for example, uh, he worked on a special way of, of extracting iron ore um, from these ore deposits uh, that uh, were kind of low grade iron uh, ore deposits. And it used his knowledge of electricity and all that. And by this time, he already sold out his shares to a General Electric. So he used all this money to produce this phenomenally huge equipment that would grind the ore down and separate the, the iron from the non-iron and all that. And it didn't work very well. It was very inefficient. He finally had to give up. He asked his accountant, okay, how much did we lose? And he says, you just lost everything you earned from the electric light bulb. A lot of people don't know it, but he invented things that were well ahead of his time. Um, the first electric car to be marketed was created by Edison. Unfortunately, it didn't, it was terribly ineffective because it went only so far and then had to get new batteries. You know, it, it, I mean, it wasn't like our Teslas today. It was, it was very, very inefficient. Uh, the batteries were huge, most, very, very heavy. Um, so he, he had a lot of inventions. He invented an airplane, it didn't work. It was made out of box kites. So he was, he was entrepreneurial. He tried to deliver to his investors uh, products that would make money and he couldn't do it. And a lot of times he would come up with an invention that he wasn't even planning on coming up with. They ended up being very successful. One, his favorite invention was not the light bulb. His fa uh, Edison's favorite invention was the photograph. He thought it was great. He never actually um, deliberately tried to invent the phonograph. What he was doing was inventing a way of recording Morse code on these cylinders so that it could be played back. So you wouldn't have to have someone translating right away the Morse code. So it would just go directly to these aluminum foil cylinders and then you can play it back. But he found out that if you played it back too fast, it sounded like regular sounds like music or people speaking. So then he thought, why can't, instead of our recording Morse code, just record singing and speech and musical instruments? And so he tried that and it worked. And there was this photograph, and the rest is history. <laughs> so the point of these... is, is that you keep, the combinatorial process is inefficient, and, and it doesn't guarantee it's, that it will work. And I don't think He's... most of the inventors that people invent, invest in, I mean, look at Steve Jobs. Yeah, All yeah. of his failures. But do... failures. 
But so d did any of these uh, creators manage to persuade the investors that, that to accept the failure? It's a risk. You're going to have to accept yeah. the risk. Okay. As, as a creator, I'm convinced, but sometimes you still have, uh, you know, the, yeah, but what if I give you $2 million instead of one? So we just have to <laughs> persist and, you know. Well, I mean, to some extent that will work because what happened in a case of um, Edison's light bulb, he had already become famous enough that he'd get a lot of investors. And the main problem, there was two problems he had to deal with in, in creating a light bulb. One was a, a distribution system that would work. And it turned out that was the easier part, even though a physicist of his day said he couldn't solve it. Uh, but the other part was creating a, a commercially viable light bulb that didn't burn out, you know, real easy, or didn't didn't involve really expensive filaments. Like uh, he, he checked into cobalt, and cobalt works really well, but it's very expensive. Okay, so what he had to do is try to find a commercially viable uh, filament. And fortunately, he got lots of investment money. So he set up this huge laboratory with lots of research assistants who are testing one kind of filament over, after another until he finally, some one of his lab assistants says, I got it. And you know what it was? You would never guess that a commercially a, a workable uh, filament for the first um, light bulb, incandescent light bulb, was a carbonized bamboo fiber. That's what he found worked. And that's because it had just the right structure of these long um, you know, uh, filaments that when carbonized, conducted electricity really well and glowed really nicely. Mm. It's institutionalized combination, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's proceed, I see. Um, maybe we're gonna go with Daniel. Alex, I'm gonna maybe keep you for the end. Yeah, so Daniel, carry on. Well, um, hi, can you hear me? That's the first question. Okay. Uh, part of my question was already uh, asked by you, so uh, regarding entrepreneurs. Um, but I go with uh, maybe uh, the request uh, for a comment because um, my background is in uh, knowledge institutes in uh, the Netherlands. And we are supposed to be an uh, intermediary between universities and the market. And for me, I really like the talk. I really like this presentation of creativity or the creative process. And I think it's something that, um, if not investors, but also managers maybe should understand because very often in the last seven years, uh, we had managers and new managers approaching our research teams in if effectively demanding, oh, we would like to have a disruptive technology. Right. Not spe <laughs> specifying what, or we want to have the game changer. And yeah. that is just, uh, well, it's a it's roadblock. For the brain. In fact, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, built in contradiction at the US Patent Office. I don't know how patent offices in Europe do this, but um, in the US Patent Office, they have three criteria that actually map on to, to my three criteria. The first criterion is that they call it novelty, which is what I call originality. Uh, the second thing is usefulness, which is, of course, my utility. And the third one is non-obviousness, which is what I call surprise, just the opposite end of the spectrum. And the, when they, by non-obvious, what they mean is it can't be something that um, could be easily inferred from anybody who's an expert in the area, anybody with, with knowledge in the area. Well, this creates a really interesting tension because if you can't patent something that, a, that an expert, like an expert engineer can come up with, then you have to patent something that no one can imagine given their expertise. <laughs> and that's a hard thing to control. Uh, all of these examples of uh, major inventions that like I talked about with regard to Edison, were cases where were cases where people couldn't have even like like a good example is um, is the phonograph 
no one could even imagine that you could do that. Um, and that you could do it with all the equipment that he used to make that phonograph was stuff that was already in his laboratory. He didn't have to invent something new, but putting it in that particular combination was something new. And it was something that couldn't be anticipated. And it was something therefore that was easy to patent because it was non-obvious that you could have a phonograph recording music. Um, and the same thing true with the movie camera. I don't know if you know, but he also invented a movie camera. And he invented the first major studio, movie studio, and was a major film producer. And uh, these are all things that no one could even think about from the technology of his time. So I, it's really hard to do things on demand. Now, a lot of times there's low level technology where it is just expertise driven. You know, you, you, this, well, this is what engineers do all the time. They're given problems to solve and they, they, they've gone to school and they learned how to solve those problems. So the probability is high, the utility is high and the prior knowledge of the utility is high. Um, but those kinds of solutions are, are often not even patentable because they're not considered to be non-obvious. But maybe the, the, that's where um, uh, entrepreneurship can take inspiration from the arts. Like maybe there are some artistic process like group experiences or, or uh, something which is less on the, on the domain of the reasoning and more on the experiential, like the senses. Uh, maybe these kind of things can uh, make, a, make a breakthrough in, a, in entrepreneurship. Well, and that's where, um, you know, my leaving out the social side um, puts a major gap in my discussion. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I talk about it, it's all inside the head. But um, it's not all inside the head. And, um, and a lot of people uh, feel, even in the sciences or in technology, that there are things that go on in lab meetings where the creativity happens that wouldn't have happened in any individual mind attending that lab meeting that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because this person contributes something and that inspires someone else to think of this. So they'll say something and someone else says this. And next thing you know, they have collectively produced a creative idea that none of them individually could have come up with. And so there are a lot of examples. I mean, a good example of that in the sciences is uh, this discovery of, of DNA, the structure of DNA by Watson and Crick was, it was not something that was just Watson and just Crick. It was a collective collaboration between the two. And if it was just one of them, they probably wouldn't have come up with the DNA structure because there's things that Watson thought about that Crick overlooked and vice versa. Uh, Dean, are you okay to answer a, a few more questions? Sure, I got one minute. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. thank you. <laughs> Martin, uh, you were next in line, I think. Uh, hi there. Um, well, um, I'm probably going to be a bit contrarian about this. Uh, first of all, I would just like to... About Nick, we can't hear you, sorry. ...about knowing the domain or... Sorry? Uh, can you hear me? One more time, sorry. Yes, closer to the microphone or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I was just going to um, uh, continue on to something that you said earlier regarding uh, creativity being domain specific and therefore that it relies on the expertise. Uh, uh, do you allow, uh, 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 would you uh, agree that the expertise can come from other sources rather than education and training? Would you allow for a genius element or for something that comes innately to contribute uh, uh, to creativity? Um, then uh, if I can just kind of continue like um, um, on, on the rest of this thing, um, uh, uh, I, I think Daniel uh, mentioned and um, that um, people are all the time uh, looking for game changes and disrupting technology. And um, I got the impression that it's a myth, but um, actually in the field where I'm operating, I'm working in the software in the industry, uh, there is a quite a lot um, uh, about thinking out of the box. Creativity doesn't seem to come from the areas of deep expertise and experiential. It comes 
comes from sparks or ingenuity and very often it comes from very young people who are introducing these novel paradigms despite the fact that they are not um, in control of the domain and therefore they don't have control and they don't know the boundaries or bounds of the technology yet they know technology is there and they can use the te technology so they kind of add so, so it's a kind of top-down um, approach rather than what you were talking about sort of everything building from the bottom down um, and so I see that very often and I would say that it contradicts the paradigm that it's based on deep kind of knowledge of the domain. Um, I agree with you 100%. Uh, a lot of creativity is uh, completely domain specific but a lot of creativity also involves a merger of two or more domains. And part of this is facilitated by um, the fact that one of the major personal predictors of creativity is a uh, personality characteristic called openness to experience. It's one of the big five personality factors. And um, people who are more open to experience, they, have, they, they, they tend to have a lot of hobbies, a lot of wide interests, uh, they may be interested in domains outside of their own particular specialty area. And they'll end up bringing that into what their, their, their creativity, their discoveries. And, and sometimes in surprising ways, a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, uh, Galileo, his, his first major astronomical discovery, I mean, basically invented observational astronomy. And his first really major observation was that the, the moon had mountains. Um, it turned out there were other people who pointed their telescopes to the moon and didn't see the mountains. They were seeing the same thing that he saw, but they just saw a flat surface that was like a marble with you know color discoloration, darks and lights and whatever. But it was just like a marble. Okay. Why did Galileo see mountains? A lot of people know this, but before he became a famous scientist, he was really into the arts. He, a lot of his good, uh, best friends were artists. And um, at this time, there was an artistic technique that was becoming very, very popular called chiaroscuro, it's light and dark. And it's a way of showing lights and darkness, shadows, and a way of establishing depth. And so, when he, and he actually taught at an art institute. I think we'll know that Galilei actually taught at an art institute, taught painting and, and how to do these kind of uh, lights and darks. So when he looked at the moon, he saw mountains. He saw relief. He saw shadows. He saw alpine, what we call alpine glow, because he was bringing in from the outside training that turned out to be highly relevant. Now, you wouldn't be able to predict that that would be relevant. It just so happened to be relevant. And uh, there's, there's many examples of that, where someone brings in from the outside um, some experience that is not really domain specific. I mean, Albert Einstein's Gedanken experiments, his thought experiments, and often involved everyday objects. I mean, for example, in special relativity, he talked about what happened when you, when you see a train go by and, uh, and you have, um, you know, like whistle, I can't remember if it was whistles or lights on opposite end of the train. What would you experience on the train versus what would you experience on the side of the tracks? Or in his general theory of relativity, he talked about what would you experience if you were in an elevator that was in free fall, okay? So he's using an everyday, well, not that we normally are in elevators that are in free fall, I hope, but, um, but he's using something from everyday experience to help him solve a problem and that's very domain specific. So how do you know that it comes from experience? How do you know that it's empirical and not just attributed to a different way of thinking? That just interests me. How would you know that Galileo used his experience from a different domain to see that and know that it just don't, don't him through a different way of, of reasoning with, with what he was saying. Well, I mean, there are different ways of reasoning. Um, I talked about in the um, in my presentation, for example, um, remote association is a different way of thinking. 
Uh, there's a lot of very interesting studies showing that people who are highly creative, they will go, their associations will go places that other people can't even imagine or even relevant to a particular word. And, um, and, and so remote association is a different way of thinking that um, makes people more creative. Um, and it is something that um, is difficult to develop. I mean, it's, it's something that's developed through ex lots of experience, uh, being widely read, um, multicultural experiences, uh, being bilingual or multilingual. Uh, there's various ways you can increase remote association, but, and I want to, you said something about, um, you know, uh, innate or, or whatever. I should point out that a lot of the characteristics that are associated with creativity have very high credibility coefficients. For example, I mentioned openness to experience. It's about 50% inheritable. And then the other 50% is through experience. So you can increase it beyond what you uh, inherited. So that sort of is an answer to the question, is genius born or made? It's both. They both play a very important role. Uh, do, do, sorry, just last thing. Do you think that the scientific uh, method uh, puts bounds on creativity? Do you think that it ob obstructs creativity to its full um, extent? Do you think uh, it's too I, restrictive, too formal? Yeah, I would. I mean, this is why um, in my talk, uh, when I talked about what are the various combinatorial processes and procedures, I start off with um, a quote from um, Claire Aubin, anything goes. He wrote a book called Against Method. And he argued that methods get in the way of scientific creativity. This, this whole idea that you have this so-called scientific method. And you know, there's a lot of philosophers who are responsible for that. Uh, you know, Rene Descartes had the method you know, that we, that we had to follow. Um, and it turns out if you look at the, the, the really great you know, creators, there is no single method that they use. I mean, for example, Isaac Newton, yeah, he's famous for the hypothetical deductive method, but he didn't always use the hypothetical deductive method. A lot of times they just use plain ordinary experiments, like the stuff he did in optics. He just he just played around with lenses and and prisms and and had a good time, you know seeing how the world worked uh, without any um, you know, a priori theorems that he was trying to prove or demonstrate in any way. So, um, so I agree with you, it, it, it can get in the way. It's, scientific method is best at, um, at the end when you're getting ready to, to, to submit something to a scientific journal. And, um, and then after the fact, you show that there's some kind of logic to it. Uh, but um, not at the beginning. At the beginning, you, you have to be basically um, more, you have to use imagination. Carry on with, uh, with questions. Uh, Alex, you had one. I do, and I realize we're over time, so I will try and be as brief as possible. But I just, I kind of wanted to, so I, I taught the course that I, I think inspired uh, Sasha to set up this, uh, this Cambridge meetup, um, mm -hmm. although I'm sure he would have done it anyway. Um, which was the Diploma in Creativity at uh, Cambridge. And obviously we've, we've read your work, Dean, and, and, uh, and so I have so a meta question to ask if I'm allowed. I'm a philosopher, please forgive me on that. Um, so I think what all the things that, many of the things that people have been talking about have kind of picked up this issue, not so much around scientific method, I think, but also around descriptive versus prescriptive. So what is the, the combinatorial model used for? It's used for describing how we understand creativity now. And lots of the questions that came up at Stanford, for instance, were around people saying, is it too male? I personally think it is. I think that you're having worked with um, women creativity theorists, including Marina, um, it's kind of challenged some of my thinking that I used to think creativity was about the expression of power. I now realize it can actually be a lot more collaborative and it's, it's actually not always just about what I do or don't do and all those kinds of things. So I think there are there is a kind of critical theory underpinning some of this, which says we need to think in different ways about creativity. And I just wondered, because I've read your work around teaching creativity and obviously teaching creatively to teach creativity, 
do we also, as theorists around creativity, need to be surprising, need to be novel, need to be kind of upending people's thinking around creativity a little bit as well. So we can create the models, but we also need to kind of flip the bath over, as it were. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would like to say there's one application of combinatorial uh, models that I, I found very interesting when um, when I listened to other talks at that Stanford conference, which you haven't heard, but a number of people were uh, interested in assessing um, scientific impact on their on their field. I mean, basically uh, citation indices and uh, and the H index and, and other things that are used to assess um, scientific impact. And a few of the people, I wish I could remember their names, they actually used um, a measure that, that looked at their references and how many different disciplines their references came from. And those people who cited a lot of different fields in their references had a bigger impact than those who just, you know, kind of focused on a, their specialty area. And, and that gets back with Martin's question too. You know, it's, it's, you have to look beyond because you don't know if the solution, you know, this gets back to Einstein. It's kind of interesting. A, a lot of people don't know this, but um, Einstein's paper, for example, on, um, on uh, equals mc squared, which is actually not the way the equation was specified, but, but that's the way it's known today, um, didn't actually have any references. He uses general knowledge of physics. And by general knowledge of physics, I mean not just Newtonian mechanics, but, but also Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. And he would put these things together. Uh, and he would do it even when he was a little kid where he would notice that there's a contradiction between Maxwell's equation and Newtonian mechanics. He first noticed that when he was 16, when he tried to imagine what it would be like to turn on a, a, a flashlight and then go at the speed of light and ask himself what he would see. And he realized that he, he shouldn't be able to see anything because the waves would stop waving if, 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 if light was away. So he already, and, and then later on in, um, in his paper on special relativity, he, he talked about a situation. He said, imagine two situations. One, I have a coil of, of, of wire and a magnet. And then I put the magnet through the coil of wire and it generates electricity. Now imagine a situation where I have a magnet and then I take a coil of wire and I move it over the magnet. It also generates electricity. And if you do it at the same speed, it does the exact same amount of electricity. Guess what? Those are absolutely equivalent acts. And yet Maxwell's equations have two different sets of equations to explain those two events. So that is wrong. There's something wrong with Maxwell's equations. If you need two sets of equations to explain the same phenomenon, it's just relative. The only difference is the relativity, what's moving and what's not. Newton had a similar revelation, I believe, uh, related to your comment about elevators earlier. The fact that if someone's standing at the ground level and someone's in the elevator, the elevator goes up. Why doesn't this person's stomach lurch as well? If everything's relative, why doesn't the person on the ground have their stomach go Whoa, when the elevator goes up? <laughs> as opposed to the other and of course, that was his argument for absolute space, which then Einstein blew to pieces with that very yeah. own realization. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, great. Thank okay. you. Um, maybe I do have to go for a but but not because I can't keep on going, but because my I have a dog that needs to poop uh, by noon. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh! Okay, so let's make sure let's make sure that we finish before that. Uh, Nick, you had a question very quickly. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, just this is about your own kind of working process, Dean, because. I just, I just don't understand how you're so productive and so creative in your own work. You know, like how, how do you fit all that in in terms of hours in the day? You know, that's why. How I, do I? Well, just looking at your Google Scholar um, sort of papers that you've had published in your books, how do you manage to produce every all that? Um, I'm doing what I really enjoy doing. 
I, I, I'm able to study whatever I'm interested in. And it's very, very broad. I can study art, you know, Guernica. I can study um, Edison. I can study, um, you know, Newton and Galileo and whatever. And um, so I, I don't get bored. I mean, as soon as I get to a point where I say, you know, I have had, I've had enough of Edison, it's time to study Picasso, you know? And that keeps me, you know, keeps me going, as well as giving me different ideas, because sometimes working on one person or one phenomenon, you know, gives me ideas about another phenomenon. But how many hours a day do you spend working? Um, of course, now I'm retired, so I can't really answer. It. I think I used to used to spend about sixteen hours. Right. You know, and that's you know that's not counting uh, teaching and administrative work and and that kind of stuff. But it's probably around sixteen hours. Time and, time flies when uh, when studying creativity. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, that's one thing that's often left out. Uh, People who are highly creative, they spend a lot of time working. And, uh, you know, Picasso, you know, there are, there are about 20,000 works that can be credited to him. You can't do 20,000 works by, uh, you know, sitting on your butt. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. So thank you all very, very much for, for attending. Uh, next one, March 16, uh, Marina Velez uh, here is going to be our next speaker about uh, art and the Anthropocene. Uh, please press your hand claps button to, <laughs> to thank very much, um, Professor Dean. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was fun. It was fun. Okay. It was really, really a, a true, true pleasure and a very, very rich conversation. So thank you so much. And then, yeah, maybe we see you again soon on some okay. other occasion. Thank all right. you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.